Well, thank you very much for giving me the chance to come and speak to you all today. You all should be interested in toxicology. The reason you should all be interested in toxicology is because it's the only thing that belongs truly to clinical pharmacology. Now, there's lots of other diseases we do, there's lots of other exciting things we do, but they, could all, they are all done by different groups of people. The only patient group I would say to you that belongs to us is poisoning. So if you want to have a clinical role that's defined and have a clear patient group in your hospital, toxicology is the way forward. So I'm a real advocate for you all going out and trying to get training in it. So today I'm going to talk about novel psychoactive substances, legal highs as they're called in the media. So what am I going to talk about? I'm going to give a bit of introduction to the MPIS. I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but if somebody doesn't know, I'll tell you what it is. And then we'll talk a bit about MPS, what they are, their history. Talk about two clusters, because they tend to occur in clusters. There tends to be outbreaks of poisoning. And we'll talk a bit about how you manage them. OK, so the National Poisons Information Service, essentially Edinburgh, Newcastle, Cardiff, Birmingham, four centres in the UK, and we provide advice on poisoning. Now, I'm sure you all know that the first port of call is Toxbase. It's used, I think, in every hospital in Britain and in Ireland, about 500,000 accesses a year. But if you don't get what you want from that, or you haven't got access to Toxbase, then you can phone up 24 hours a day, get put through to a poisons information officer, and if you need to, get put through to a consultant and talk about the case and get advice. So that's what we offer. Now, a shameless plug coming up, and that is for the Toxbase app. You can all get it for free. You can all download it for free on Android or iPhone. It's got the whole of Toxbase, works offline, and then you've got it in your pocket. You don't need to go to a computer in the NHS ever again for it. OK, so if you look at Toxbase and what people are looking at, it's not surprising, really. Paracetamol is number one. That's our biggest workload. But there's also ibuprofen, diazepam, common drugs that you'd expect people to take. If you look at what comes through to the consultants, so people who have phoned MPIS, needed some specialist advice, wanted to speak to a consultant, then still paracetamol is number one. That's our workload. There's a plug for paracetamol. It's more common than myocardial infarction, hip fracture, or COPD. However, number two, and the focus of this talk really, is around drugs of abuse. And they're the second biggest call. Drugs of misuse, agitated patient, substance unknown. So let's talk about novel psychoactive substances. So you get headlines in the news all the time. Some of them are, are more serious, some of them are more ridiculous. You get legal high deaths increase sharply. Devon teenagers are taking legal highs. The family's left heartbroken after the death of legal highs. Legal highs are soaring in number. Legal highs are more lethal than heroin. Some of them are more ridiculous. Legal high teen ripped his scrotum off. It's in the news a lot, and there's a lot of concern, there's a lot of politics around this. So what are novel psychoactive substances? So, they're drugs. That's all they are, they're drugs. They're substances that have very similar or the same effects as well-known traditional illegal drugs. They're often very similar to amphetamines. However, they're not controlled under the Misuse of Drugs Act. So therefore, if you like, they're not yet illegal highs. And they're sold, but they're, not, they're sold not for human consumption. So they're sold at bath salts, plant foods, because saying that for human consumption would certainly be illegal. And they're sold at shops. So this is an example of a shop in Edinburgh. But they're also sold in corner shops. So here's a packet of burst bath salts. It's probably ethylphenidate that was just sold in this corner shop in Edinburgh. And they're sold online, and you can go online now, you can use the internet here, and you can look and find all kinds of legal highs that are for sale. Now, a lot of work's done by um, David Wood and Paul Dargan at St Thomas's just across the road. And one of the things they've shown in one of their nice papers is that there isn't really any quality to this. We must dispel the myth that novel psychoactive substances have some kind of quality control because they're legal, which is what some patients might think. So, for instance, here they bought legal highs off the internet. I don't know whether it was the research fellow they got to do it, but there we are. And one of the most important things to say is that a lot of them had no drug detected at all. A lot of what was bought was just caffeine. A lot of them were mixes of different things, some of the things which certainly are illegal. So the quality's not there. There's a mixture of things you get when you buy it. 
And there's a lot of them. So here's a study done in Europe which shows essentially the number of new novel psychoactive substances per year that are discovered. And they're discovered in all kinds of ways. There's seizures from shops. There's people buying them from shops. There's collecting urine and urinals in the middle of centre of town, see what people are taking. But essentially, in 2012, there was about 73 new chemical structures that appeared across Europe. And if you look at a map of Europe, where the more red is the more legal high use, I'm not surprised to say the UK is the highest. In fact, I think it is Scotland. We usually are the highest for most things related to drugs. So we use a lot of legal highs and there's a problem. OK, so there were simpler times when you could give this talk and we could just classify drugs quite easily. So there could be sedatives, stimulants, or hallucinogens. So in the past, you'd say opiates, stimulants, hallucinogens. It was all quite straightforward. Now, sort of recreational drugs are a bit more difficult to classify. And I think this drugs wheel that's put out by various charities is quite useful. So it breaks drugs into stimulants that essentially make people agitated, tachycardic, increased energy, I mean, there are desirable effects. The empathogens, I said that right, which essentially is like MDMA, it makes people connect with people, it makes people feel loved up. The psychedelics, hallucinogens, dissociatives, gives people out-of-body experiences, the cannabinoids, depressants, and opioids. But actually there's a huge number in each group. And it's got long, confusing names, and it's very difficult to tell which one's legal and which one's illegal just from the name. And that's an important point. They're all in the same groups. It's just that some have been made illegal, some are still legal. But it's not a new thing. I mean, it's important as well to put this in context that novel psychiatric substances, legal highs, aren't new. So here we've got heroin cough mixture. You could argue that's certainly a legal high. Cocaine hairdressing. Cocaine toothache drops. These were legal when they were sold at the time. They only became illegal when there was evidence of harm and people wanted to control it. So this isn't anything new. So to run through some of the groups of novel psychoactive substances quickly, some of the main groups, so you've got a feel of what's out there. We'll go through cannabinoids, phenophylamines, caffeinones, papyrazines and tryptamines. So cannabis, we all know about, tetrahydro, cannabinoid. Cannabis is used a lot one of the most used drugs in the country. In truth, it doesn't really cause a lot of hospital admissions. I can't remember the last time I saw somebody come into hospital purely for cannabis. But when the cannabinoid receptors were cloned, it gave a possibility of making agonists at these receptors. So what you ended up with were synthetic, synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonists. A lot of them came from the pharma industry. They were dumped because they didn't have a lot of use. The patent literature had their structure. Therefore, chemists abroad could make them and therefore chemists abroad could sell them for various guises. So, they're not really like cannabis. They're very selective, potent agonists to a certain cannabinoid receptor, whereas cannabis tends to have a cocktail of different agonists and antagonists in. The result is, they're smoked, but they produce a lot more confusion, agitation, and seizures than cannabis does, which, as I said, is a rare cause for coming into hospital. So I think the important thing with cannabinoid receptor agonists are that they're really not cannabis and shouldn't be considered as that. And if you have a patient who's agitated and has smoked something, I would say this was the likely cause. Here's a hideous slide of phenylphylamines. In no way is it meant to be remembered. All it's saying basically is from a basic chemical structure, we've got offshoots of all kinds of different drugs, some of which are illegal, MDMA, ecstasy, the 2C series, some are legal, some are illegal. The D series, some are legal, some are illegal. So basically, you get a large number of different structures modified in different ways, and some are legal, some aren't. But they're all similar in terms of being stimulants and in terms of being kind of similar to ecstasy or amphetamines. In adverse effects, they produce sweating, confusion, anxiety. They're the patient who's taken a powder, who turns up in A&E, &A, agitated with four policemen. OK, we'll come back to the management a bit later. This is a particularly cool one, Bromo dragonfly. It's quite big in Sweden. Said because it kind of looks like a dragonfly, the structure. I suppose it does, doesn't it? Wings there, tail. And it's a very intense vasospasm agent. And it causes intense vasospasm and it causes people's fingers to actually come off. So here's people who've taken it and they've lost their fingers because of intense vasospasm. 
Especially how, look at how it sold the deadly designer drug. Still very popular. Synthetic cathinones are basically derived from cat and are very similar to phenylethylamines. They include mephedrone, which was kind of the poster child for legal highs when it came out around 2007. In 2007, you could order mephedrone in London online and have it delivered within half an hour. It was very big until it was made illegal, and that saw its use fall away. And we'll talk about what happens when drugs are made illegal later. Um, but they're also derived from that compound of mephedrone. Papyrazines, stimulants, again, kind of were sold as an alternative to ecstasy. Have a serotonergic effect, which tends to give you the more sort of enactogenic, loved up effect, the dopamine effect, which tends to be more the stimulant effect. Um, and they're often what was found in ecstasy, although ecstasy now is becoming much more pure. When I say ecstasy, I mean MDMA. So MDMA now is much pure. In fact, MDMA is a stronger percentage now than it's ever been. So I suspect we'll see a lot more serotonin toxicity. Tryptamines are derived from tryptophan amino acid. They're short-acting hallucinogens, DMT being the classic. It was what's taken in Vietnam movies. So if you watch any good Vietnam movie, there's always a scene when they hallucinate, that's DMT. It's short acting, it's very, getting more popular now. But the main reason I put it in is because you get it from this toad. You get a similar 5-H5-hydroxy DMT from the buffo toad. And in Australia, people lick toads. And you lick the toad and you hallucinate. And it's actually quite... Well, obviously quite common in Australia, it does happen. And here's an example of two people, this man in a club licking a toad to get its hallucinogenic juices. All right, so there's a bit of a whistle-stop tour for a bit of legal highs. But let's talk about two clusters to sort of highlight what management challenges they can have and what you can do about it. So the first cluster is a few years ago now. It was in Edinburgh in 2010, and it was this drug, Ivory Wave, which none of us in truth had ever heard of in 2010. It was reported in 2009 as containing this drug, MDPV, which was similar to methadrone. But in truth, we'd never really come across Ivory Wave. In 2010, there was a surge of people presenting to our local hospital, the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh. If we look at the numbers, there it is, look a shiny, really sunny day. That's what it's always like. Um, if you look at, in August, the number of people coming into our hospital is sort of cumulative number. We ended up with around 20 by the end of the month. There was the same number, if not more, at the psychiatric hospital of people who presented with sort of psychiatric toxicity. So we're talking about 50, 60 people suddenly coming into hospital, having never, ever seen this before. If we look at the presentation of the patients, it's a terrible slide, I don't expect to remember it, other than they're quite similar to what what I think we've got used to now, and that is that they are presenting with agitation, hallucinations, insomnia, anxiety, essentially. And they're quite long-acting as well. I mean, some of these people ingested the drug up to even a week ago, five days ago. So it's quite a long-acting drug, and it was really unpleasant. The management, well, it's toxicology. We gave them benzodiazepines and chlorpromazine because that's what we do. Uh, and it's pretty good management. But what we did do was we drew up a criteria for admission that I think has stood the test of time and I think is, is useful as a ballpark. So what we said were people who needed to be admitted once they're in the emergency department, who needs to come in? We said if the CK was greater than 3,000, why 3,000? It's very back of the envelope, but I think it's reasonable. Any abnormality of renal function, seizures or any other medical complication, that's straightforward enough. And then we said if... if if certain parameters didn't settle, despite the benzodiazepine and the chlorpromazine, that being tachycardia, hypertension, temperature. I think those criteria are reasonable in terms of who needs to come into hospital or who needs to be transferred from another hospital to your hospital. So what we can do with Toxbase, one of the cool things we do with Toxbase is we can actually do research with it. And we can look at what you're looking at. And that's part of the reason for plugging the app, because once you've got the app, we can see what you look at and where you look at it all over the world. So what we could do is we could look and say, OK, were people looking for Ivory Wave when this was happening in Edinburgh? Or was it just an Edinburgh thing? So if we look at the talk space, this is national, number of people looking at talk space for Ivory Wave. And we see basically, from there's nothing before July, that's why there's nothing there, 
But then it goes up and it plateaus off so there's no more around Christmas. If we look at the telephone calls, because we keep a record of the telephone calls, it's even clearer. Really, nothing, nothing before June, in fact. July, a few, and then that first week of August shoots up. And there's loads of people calling about this drug. And you might say, well, that's everyone from Edinburgh. But it's not. If we look across the country, so this is August. The first person to look at it, actually, was in Dorset. And then August to September, we see the whole country looking at Ivory Wave. Nothing before here. One in Dorset, whole country Ivory Wave. By Christmas, it's barely sort of disappearing. And in March, it's a few. So there's this sudden event where everybody was looking at it. And if we look at the details of the telephone calls, they were very similar to Edinburgh. There were agitation, there were muscle twitches, there were jerks. Six people to hold the patient down. Five days of agitation and hallucinations, long time. The patient was intubated, the patient was sectioned, the patient had renal failure. So there was obviously something going on that was affecting locally, but looking at talk space, it was affecting the whole country. So what we did was, and I don't know if it was right or wrong, but this is what we did at the time, is we sort of framed it as a public health thing, along the lines of, if this was a shop selling pizzas and everyone was poisoned, you'd go to public health and they would close the shop. So we went to public health, and it was slightly you know, difficult to understand what, quite what to do, but eventually we, my colleague went on TV, there he is, went to TV, given a statement because we wanted to try and get to the users and saying it's not helpful. It's not good. I don't know if that's the right or wrong thing to do, and we can talk about that, but that's what we did. And also, public health, to be fair to them, gave a rapid response. And in Scotland and England and Wales, the health ministers wrote to each hospital trust within about two or three days, saying, there's this going on, you need to keep a record of what's happening, you need to have a plan. So the response from public health was actually very good. So the question is, why did it die away? Why did people stop taking Ivory Wave? Because if you look at the data from Toxbase, the calls stopped. Now, that, you could argue, is because people got used to managing it. Having a look at it locally, people did stop coming in. And I think, and I don't really know, but I think the reason was because it was unpleasant. The media had reports saying, this drug is bad. But also the users didn't like it. So what happens with legal highs, with novel psychoactive substances, is there's a group of people called psychonauts, so what I suggest you do is, tonight, go and have a look for psychonauts. Psychonauts test the drugs and then write about them. So what happens is someone makes a drug, psychonaut takes it, and online writes a blog, like, this is quite good, this is awful, and then people read it, they're very influential people, and if it's really good, there's your market. But the psychonauts, of which these two swim and scuba legends, um, didn't like it. They didn't like it. So users didn't like it. Me didn't like it. And I think that's probably why it disappeared. OK, so what was it? Well, there had been a little spate of similar poisonings in Ireland about a month or two before this UK one, except it was called WAC. But it was very similar in that there was agitation. But it was very similar because there were very prolonged symptoms, five, six days of symptoms. So we had a sample of the ivory wave. We also had blood samples from patients. So we could identify what it was. And what happened was the, the police went to the shops, seized the ivory wave, then tested it. But when it wasn't anything illegal, no one was interested. However, they still had the packets, so we could test what it was. And it turned out to be this drug, which you've never heard of, desoxypiprodol, which essentially is a, was a, a, a sort of precursor of Ritalin. Now, it was made by one of the big pharma companies in the 70s. And so it structures out there online. But it was dropped because its half-life was too long. And then Ritalin came along, and that was a big market success. So this drug was shelved. But somebody in a lab somewhere saw the structure, made it. They're very good chemists. Found out it was a strong stimulant. Found out, importantly, it was legal. And it went into the market. Why did it suddenly appear? Because if you remember at the start, the ivory wave, I said, was MDPV, where methadrone was made illegal. Simply, the packet got switched from being this MDPV, which was now illegal, to being this drug, which is legal. So we think that's why it suddenly appeared. I mean, this, I think, is a typical story for legal highs. 
Essentially, one is made illegal and another one simply replaces that market space. The people selling the drugs in the shops, on the internet, are not interested in selling illegal drugs. That market is not as lucrative. It involves high risk. So legislation, essentially ACMD acted and made desoxypiprodrol illegal. However, I went online this morning, and here's ivorywave.com. You can buy it. Don't know what's in it. I doubt it's desoxypiprodrol now, because that's illegal, but it's still available. Interestingly, it says it's not available in the UK. However, when it comes to car charging you, it charges you still in pounds. Okay, just to talk briefly about a second cluster. This was from a drug called Green Rolex, which caused havoc in Scotland. It actually was very unpleasant and killed people. Essentially, here are some news stories. Police warning over Green Rolex pills. That's what they looked like. And essentially, we were getting cases where patients essentially were coming into hospital in cardiac arrest. They had hyperthermia, 41, 42 degrees. They were rigid. It was described as if they were like, had rigor mortis. They were acidotic, hyperkalemic, and a lot of them died, particularly around the Glasgow area. Green Rolex contained this drug, well, it came three drugs, actually. PMA, or PMMA, which has got a, a, a sort of catchy title of death, uh, which basically is an amphetamine derivative. It causes serotonin release and reuptake inhibition and MAO inhibition. Benzopropazine, which we've talked about, and it did include MDMA as well, so a lot of serotonin agents. And there'd been reported that PMMA and PMA were dangerous. Here's a paper from 2012 in Israel saying that this drug is highly toxic. And what it produces is serotonin toxicity, and that's what these patients had. So I thought it was worth just talking a little bit about serotonin toxicity. So the features of serotonin toxicity are sort of shown in this figure from the New England Journal, where there's a good review about 10 years ago. And essentially, the patients are agitated. They've got hyperreflexia, and the core feature is clonus. And they've got autonomic instability. And the core feature is high temperature, high blood pressure. So these patients are different to neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome is dopamine receptor blockade. And those patients are stiff, rigid, and quiet. The neuroleptic malignant syndrome patient is the classic on perhaps two or three different neuroleptics, lady from a psychiatric hospital, possibly in the 70s or 80s, who comes over to your general hospital because she's got a temperature and she's probably got a UTI, she's a bit off. And you, on post eight round, might think she's got a UTI until somebody thinks, oh, she's a bit stiff, and you do a CK and it's very high. And they die of rhabdomyolysis. But it's quite different. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome is not common in overdose or in recreational use, whereas your serotonin toxicity, they're agitated. They're hot, and they've got clonus. And I don't mean a sort of subtle clonus. I mean, if you move back the ankle, it beats until you stop it beating. They'll often have ocular clonus. The eyes will be going up and down. So serotonin toxicity, as we've said, core features, clonus, temperature, mental state changes. In terms of diagnosing it, it's actually quite straightforward. If they've got clonus, and they've got a serotonin agent, it's serotonin syndrome can be differential from neuroleptic malignant syndrome we've talked about. Sympathomimetic toxidrome, that's your amphetamines, cocaine. Patients agitated, patients hot, but they don't have clonus. Um, other things it might get mixed up with, anticholinergic delirium, so anticholinergic dry, dry skin, big pupils, hallucinating, but no clonus. How do you manage serotonin toxicity? You stop the drugs that are causing it. That might sound obvious, and it is obvious if it's somebody coming in having taken recreational drugs. But remember, drugs like tramadol cause it, so you may have to stop drugs on the drug chart. The temperature's the key. Essentially, if, you're, if your temperature's going up, you're losing. If your temperature's coming down, you're winning. They need cooling. It's the hyperthermia that's the first thing that's going to kill them. So what you do for that is you give benzodiazepines and cooling. Now, there are various ways of cooling. There are various ways people say do it, dunk them in an ice bath. I think in truth, it depends what you've got. So I think you should use everything you have got. Do these treatments work? Well, the only paper I could find was a paper in rats where they induced serotonin toxicity by giving an MAOI and giving 5-HT, essentially. And the rats got a temperature, and if you gave them diazepam, they got less of a temperature. It's not high-quality evidence, but there was some evidence. 
The other drug is you can use is ciproheptadine. So ciproheptadine is a 5-HT2 antagonist. So it makes sense. If you give an antagonist to serotonin, it should block the effect. And in this rat model, indeed it did. In fact, at this dose, for what it's worth, had quite a pronounced effect. The problem with ciproheptadine in humans is it's only available orally, and in fact it's often not available at all. You can also give chlorpromazine. Chlorpromazine is also a 5-HT2 antagonist. There are case reports of it working in humans, and in this rat paper again, there was some effect. The dose response curve shifted to the right. I think we can say whether that's useful or not. But there's some case reports of it being useful. So, in terms of serotonin toxicity, as was this case series of green Rolex, remove the precipitating drug, think about toxicity. Other things, once you've controlled the temperature, are using these CK and sodium. They're the things that change afterwards. Okay, so we're coming up towards the end. I thought finally we might just think a bit about what happens when you make drugs illegal. So recently, a drug called ethylphenidate, which was known as Burst or Blue Stuff in Edinburgh, was made illegal. It was all the rage in Edinburgh. It was used a lot by IV drug users. Frankly, it was awful. They came in extremely agitated with horrendous sores where they'd been injected. And there was huge numbers of them. To be honest, it felt like you were seeing the start of how I imagine AIDS felt 20, 30 years ago. You were seeing these patients, huge numbers suddenly coming in, very unwell. Um, and the reason they were doing it was it was replacing IV heroin because I think probably because it was more available and cheaper. It's probably the honest answer. But it was made illegal. So when it was made illegal, you could look at what happens before and after. And this is, this is just descriptive data, but I think it's interesting. So here we've got our ethylphenidate use. This is the number of patients attending the Royal Infirmary, having said they took this drug. And it's quite obvious what they've taken. And here we are, our typical sort of number per week, 10, 12 per week. The band comes in and the number falls away. Which is what we would expect. It's what we see. When a drug becomes illegal, it stops being sold. And our experience is it falls away. You can argue whether making drugs right, illegal is right or wrong, but in our experience, use disappears when they're made illegal. However, what did happen was, and this is backed up by deaths data from the Commonwealth, Procurator Fiscal in Scotland, is there was a spike in heroin use. Because once this drug became illegal, patients switched back to using heroin, but unfortunately they didn't have the tolerance to the heroin anymore, and so they took the same doses they took six months ago when they stopped, and they overdosed. And so we saw an increase in the number of people coming into hospital with heroin toxicity and an increase across Scotland in deaths. So I think that highlights the unintended consequences that can happen when you make one drug illegal. And that is, they get replaced by something else and that something else may be more dangerous. Okay, and in terms of testing samples, this is from Wales, from John's Land. Just highlight the website Wedenos, where you can essentially, as I understand it, send in your drugs and they'll tell you what they are. And I think it's fascinating just to look and see what different drugs contain. So there's a few examples. A legal high cannabis that was sent in, looks a bit like cannabis, sent in from somebody, it was smoked, it made them relaxed. It contained cannabis, heroin, paracetamol, caffeine. That's quite nice. Paracetamol? Okay. We've had a few legal highs actually have tested positive for paracetamol. Uh, here we've got one that's not stated that is pure paracetamol. <laughs> Another one that was speed, that was salbutamol, which you can imagine would be a bit like speed, a bit like an amphetamine. And gogaine, which is one of these synthetic cocaines that they singly, unimaginatively name to rhyme with cocaine, just so it's obvious, gogaine which contains ethylphenidate, which is now illegal, lignocaine, and methiopropamide, which is a particularly nasty drug. So, just to sort of sum up, legal high is common, and it's a challenge that's not going to go away. It'll change, it'll morph, there'll be new drugs replacing old drugs, but it's not going to go away. They're mainly stimulants, and they tend to occur in clusters. One drug comes, one drug goes. And people die from them. They have very serious effects. Thank you all very much.